What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video. And in today's video, I'm going to be putting together an awesome RTX 3080 Ti gaming PC build. Is this a worthy upgrade over the already powerful 3080 or just another pointless GPU release that you can't buy? Well, in today's video, I'm going to run you through all of the components we chose and why, take a deep dive into the performance of this card and then boot our system up to see just how good it looks and of course performs. So without any further ado, Let's do this. We're going to come back to the new 3080 Ti very shortly, so hold your horses. Before we do that though, let's install as many components into the motherboard today as possible and really get the ball rolling with our gaming PC build. This is NZXT's N7 B550. Now I'd recommend you go for a B550 board over X570 nowadays. You still get largely the same feature set with support for Gen 4 SSDs, plenty of RAM and up to a Ryzen 9 processor without the annoying chipset fan that you have on X570. So good work all around. NZXT in my view have nailed it with this board. A built-in rear IO shield with Wi-Fi included, support for as I say up to Ryzen 9 CPUs and black plastic shrouding across the board make it an awesome choice. We're going to kick things off by installing the CPU uh, into the motherboard first off. This is AMD's top of the range Ryzen 9 5900X. Well technically there is also a 5950X which is slightly faster but that's seemingly out of stock everywhere. So this is what we're going to opt for instead. With 12 cores, 24 threads and a boost clock speed up to 4.8 gigahertz, this has to be one of the most insane chips on the market right now. It leaves Intel for absolute dust and I'd recommend this over the latest Core i9 options any day of the week. Sorry Intel but uh, it's just a fact, AMD are absolutely killing it at the moment and this is going to be an awesome choice for the system today. I'm going to be pairing the 5900X with a 32 gigabyte kit of RAM from Corsair. This Vengeance RGB Pro SL is gonna do the job perfectly. A 3600 megahertz clock speed out the box is what you want for Ryzen, as any slower will give you some performance issues. And this kit also includes a nice RGB heat spreader across each of the dims. Perfect for making our build today look awesome. Make sure to get subscribed by the way as well for a new build we've got coming soon that's anti-RGB. Hasn't got any RGB anywhere. But that is not this video. This video is all about 3080 Ti, Ryzen 9 and RGB. And then we're just going to go ahead and slot the randoms in one by one and we're good to go. That brings us nicely on then to the last component to install onto the motherboard today and that is our M.2 SSD storage. This is Western Digital's Black SN8 50 drive. It's a fast Gen 4 NVMe drive with speeds up to 7 gigabytes per second. Drives are increasingly becoming a bottleneck with the fastest GPUs, so a Gen 4 option with a 3080 Ti is absolutely the way to go. If you've got a 3060 or 3060 Ti, then a slower Gen 3 drive is going to be absolutely fine. But for us, better safe than sorry, and it will make our system absolutely rapido today. Right, let's go ahead and get it installed under the top M.2 heatsink cover with the NZXT logo, a little something like this. Not too difficult, and we'll just pop the cover nicely back into place. And once we've done that, we can pick up the case choice for today's build and go ahead and move the motherboard over. This build is very much so a full house for team NZXT, so you NZXT fans out there will be pleased. This though is their H710, a case I have been so excited to get my hands on for the longest time. This video is not even sponsored by NZXT or anything. I'm just so excited to finally use this chassis. Okay, look at that. Is that not just absolutely awesome? This is basically Basically just a massive version of their 210i or that's just a tiny version of this either way it's a really really cool looking chassis and you can see once again we've got a bit of a two-tone aesthetic going on bit of black bit of white and that's where the n7 board is gonna fit in perfectly I always recommend that you take off both the case side panels first of all to make the chassis nice and easy to work with I had no idea that this case worked like this but you press this button and the rear panel comes off that's insane that is amazing Still have to use a screw for the uh, main glass panel though, so someone get the violins out. What you want to go ahead and look for is this little NZXT box. Inside of here you'll find all of the screws and stuff that you need to actually install the motherboard into place. And just makes that whole process a little bit easier. Once you've got these, slide the motherboard in with the rear I.O. shield going through the back panel of the case and secure the board down through the nine screw hole locations. Three up top, three across the middle and three along the bottom. A little something 
like this. Lovely stuff. And once we've done that, we're just going to pop off the top panel as well, because I think it's about time we install the CPU cooler for today's system. In order to do that, we just need to take off the radiator bracket at the top of the case, which will allow us to screw the cooler in outside and then drop it in from the top. Nice and easy, nice and simple. And for that, we need the CPU cooler, which just like magic, I have behind me. Now, this is NZXT's Kraken Z53. This is the 240 mil version, but a three 60 mil is also a great shout. I've used NZXT coolers in the past, but never a cooler with a screen on it. This will actually give us some key metrics through NZXT's already fantastic cam software, which I'll put on your screen now, that allows you to monitor all your different system information. And having that front and center in our build is gonna be quite exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, I have done an oopsie. I've put the fans on the wrong way around. The cables pointing this way is what we want. But when, of course, we flip the mount round, they're the wrong way. So, uh, <laughs> Bear with me while I take the fans off and put them back on the right way round because I'm an idiot. With the radiator mount installed back into the case, we need to secure the water block onto the CPU. This is fairly complicated, but let me explain it in super simple terms. Step one, remove the black plastic brackets that come pre-installed around the CPU. Step two, take these posts and secure them down onto the backplate holes that are revealed once you've removed those black plastic brackets. Step three, secure this mounting plate around the CPU water block, a little something like this. And then step four, secure the water block onto the plates using these four thumb screws. See, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> Could definitely be a little bit simpler here from NZXT, but all in all, not too painful as far as CPU cooler installations go. And with the cooler installed, we can finally move on to the graphics card. It is, of course, the brand new RTX 30. TI. All of you guys waiting for a successor to the hugely popular and hugely powerful 2080 Ti finally have what you're looking for with a card that should give us some nice performance gains over the regular 3080 without the price tag that you get with something like a 3090. The 3090 has loads of video memory and other stuff which you don't really need uh, if you're just doing gaming applications. Even video editing or streaming on the 3080 Ti is of course going to be no problem. This is the Founders Edition, meaning it's straight from NVIDIA and features their really unique cooler design that we love here on the channel. They have made a few alterations though. The color scheme has stayed largely the same, but this part of the card has gone shiny. And you can actually see if I move the GPU around, how good it looks. The backplate is pretty similar to what we've seen with the 3070 and 3080. We have of course got NVIDIA's fancy fan system where they pull air in from the bottom of the card when it's installed and push it out of the top of the GPU. There is of course one major elephant in the room though to discuss before we look at performance and that's stock and availability. Now there has been huge issues getting hold of a GPU since Ampere launched back in September of 2020. This has been a combination of increased demand from gamers during the pandemic, but also of course cryptocurrency miners. Add on to that a global silicon shortage which is causing havoc across so many different industries and it all starts to get really messy. There are two big glimmers of hope for gamers though. Nvidia are making more GPUs than they ever have before, which is good for supply in the long run. With semiconductor factories ramping up and putting huge money into getting more products out there. The second big bit of news though comes from Ethereum, the currency we all love to hate. Well, they announced in a recent blog post that they'll be transitioning away from GPU mining basically completely in the coming months. And while they haven't put an exact date on it, that indicates we may be looking September, October time before GPU mining might just be dead and buried. That's enough of stock and availability though. What about performance? Well, in our testing, we saw around 7 to 14% improvement over the 3080, closer to the 10% mark across most of our gaming titles. This is a nice performance jump. It's nothing landmark. It's nothing revolutionary, but if the 3080 doesn't quite pack enough punch for what you're after, then the 3080 Ti is possibly the card for you. It's also going to look quite nice in our clean build aesthetic today, once we've gone ahead and got it installed. To do this, we're just going to remove a couple of the PCI covers, slot the card into place, and then dig out NVIDIA's really bulky, horrible power adapter, which connects up to that actually quite clever, compact power adapter, which hopefully we'll see power supplies start to adopt in the coming months, coming years, who knows at this point. And with that, all that's left to do is install the power supply before we get the system booted up to take a deeper look at performance and, of course, aesthetics. For that, I've selected NZXT's C850. 
50. It's a fully modular 80 plus gold certified power supply with 850 watts of output. Something I'd recommend for the 3080 Ti. 750 was pushing it a little bit on the 3080 at times, so 850 is absolutely where you should be going. Make sure you pick up a good power supply for your build. It doesn't have to be NZXT, it's not going to be seen, but it always is nice to have everything that ties in and fits nicely together. Something you'll see us do in our other builds. If you're subscribed, which if you're not already, you should be, uh, to the Geekawatt channel. stuff. Aesthetics aside, let's now take a look at performance and see whether the 3080 Ti really justifies its pretty hefty MSRP price increase over the standard 3080. Before we take a closer look at each of the titles, on your screen now is a summary, a snapshot view of all the different numbers we gathered in the biggest games out there. As I say, we'll take a closer look at each of these titles in just a second, and you can navigate between them using the timestamps on the playback bar and linked in the description below. Let's kick things off with Apex Legends though at 1440p and then later at 4K. 1440p high settings gave us an impressive 221 frames a second. The game visually looked fantastic, and this is of course with the frame rate set to unlimited in the Origin in-game launcher, as this actually can limit the frame rate on Apex Legends, so top tip for you there. 4K in Apex was also pretty good. High settings gave us an average of 164 frames a second. Visually, the game looked amazing at 4K. High settings across the board. And these esports level frame rates at 4K are awesome to see. GTA 5 is next up. And at 4K again, it's a pretty positive story. Giving us 136 frames a second. Tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. While dropping the resolution down to 1440p. Brings us up to 146. 6 FPS. So only another 10 FPS or so in the game's inbuilt benchmark, but both looked great. Next up is Watch Dogs Legion. Now we tested this at a few different settings as it allows us to really leverage the power of DLSS and ray tracing. Let's start off by running at 4K with DLSS and RTX on. RTX of course being ray tracing, which provides us much more realistic lighting, reflections and shadows, and DLSS being Nvidia's powerful AI-backed resolution scaler that actually helps to give you a bit of frame rate upside by rendering the game out at a slightly lower resolution and using AI to upscale. With DLSS and RTX on, we got an impressive 85 frames a second in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, while keeping DLSS on and turning ray tracing off jumps us up to around 114 frames a second. Only 29 FPS difference between ray tracing on and off, which is very impressive and shows the ray tracing prowess of the 3080 Ti, especially over its smaller brother, the 3080. Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War is next up and it's another ray tracing title out there. First up at 4K high settings with ray tracing and DLSS enabled, we got an average of 70 frames a second, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. Turn ray tracing off and this jumps up to around about 93, once again tested in the zombies mode to give us some repeatable results. No in-game benchmark here so we can't guarantee exactly similarities but you can see visually the game looked fantastic. Drop down to 1440p with ray tracing on and the frame rate jumps up to 75 from 70 at 4k with ray tracing on so 4k is perhaps the one you want to go for. The next title on the list today is a lot easier to run than Cold War but still incredibly popular. It is of course Valorant. At 4k high settings we got an average of 411 frames a second. You heard me right over 400 FPS at Valorant. At tune down to 1440p and the FPS jumps up slightly to 429. The fact we're not seeing a huge FPS differential between the higher and slightly lower resolutions indicates more of a CPU bottleneck than a GPU bottleneck, which is impressive considering we're using a Ryzen 9 5900X. It's absolutely bonkers. Next up then is Cyberpunk. At 4K with ray tracing on, we got an average of 66 frames per second. Visually, the game looked pretty good. While dropping down to 1440p gives us 116 frames a second when ray tracing is disabled. So you're able to achieve more than 60 FPS at 4K with ray tracing on. But if you really want that extra frame rate upside, 1440p with ray tracing off is where it's at for Cyberpunk. The next title today is Overwatch one of my favourite games, definitely a bit easier to run, uh, but still a decent test of modern GPUs. At 4K on the Ultra preset, we got an average of 258 frames a second, 
while this increased to 303 FPS if you drop the resolution down to 1440p. So evidently less of a CPU bottleneck with Overwatch than some of the other games today. Fortnite then is the next game on the list at 1080p competitive settings, which is low across the board with DLSS enabled and the render distance set to far. This gave us an average of 271 frames a second with the power of DLSS here really helping to accelerate our frame rate near the 300 mark while 1080p high reduces you down to 196. So you're gaining around about 61 frames a second by opting for competitive over high settings. 1440p is also good if you'd like to play Fortnite with that bit more visual fidelity. High settings gave us an average of 167 frames per second. Fortnite at 4K with DLSS set to balance this time round gave us an average of 144 frames a second, while visually the game looked absolutely fantastic. The next title today they just keep on coming ladies and gents is a bit of Call of Duty's Warzone. Enabling DLSS in Call of Duty's Warzone, the latest DLSS 2.0 update of course, gave us a solid 135 FPS very comfortably breaking the 100 FPS barrier on average. So we did get more than this at times and actually getting close to the 144 Hertz region that some people are going to be aiming for. Visually look great, no lag, no stuttering, no screen tearing. So happy days all around. At 4K, we got an average of 115 frames a second. Of course, no ray tracing support, but you do get DLSS 2.0. While this increases by around about 22 frames a second at 1440p, comparable settings. Rainbow Six Siege is next up then before we take a look at Control, Death Stranding and Minecraft RTX to round off the gaming benchmarks. Tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, we got 220 frames a second on average at 4K high settings, while 1440p high settings yielded us 336. So around about 100 FPS in it, which is not too bad. Next up then is Control at 4K with both ray tracing and DLSS enabled. We got a pretty impressive 117 frames per second. To get over 100 FPS at 4K high settings is pretty bonkers. It wasn't too dissimilar a story in Death Stranding, the next title on the list today. At 4K with DLSS enabled, we got 66 frames per second, while visually the game looked absolutely awesome. Death Stranding is not one of the most popular titles out there, but it is bloody cool and it looks really, really nice as far as gaming experiences go. And then finally, the last game today is a bit of Minecraft. Minecraft RTX to be precise, no ordinary Minecraft. And here we were capped up at 60 frames a second. You can unlock this cap uh, under normal circumstances, but because of our beta drivers and all sorts of other stuff, we couldn't quite get it past this. But we got some great results and the game visually on your screen now, as you can see, looks really quite nice. And with that, that wraps it up for the world's longest benchmarking session and the whole video. If you enjoyed it, give it a big old like rating, make sure to get subscribed. Thank you for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.